my pleasure to be here. My name is Diana Allegretti and I'm from Cornell Tech. Uh, we are under the umbrella of Cornell University, which is located upstate about four hours north of us um, in Ithaca, New York. Cornell Tech is a new startup um, campus and it was born out of an economic development project. The city of New York um, put forth a um, international competition uh, for an applied science and engineering campus. And today we do have an expert in the audience here, my colleague from Will Cornell, Dimitri, who was part of the Economic Development Corp, um, who was on that team selecting us. So we teamed up with uh, Technion, which is the Israeli Institute of Technology, and we put forth a proposal. So um, what the city was offering was um, th a choice of three different sites, as well as $100 million of seed money. So um, there was a whole long process that we had to go through. Part of that after we won the competition was that we needed to go through what's called the Euler process. It's a very rigorous prescribed process in the city of New York when public lands are given to a private entity. So after that, we had to close on the land. There was a lot of complications with that. Um, the land was owned by the city, which then was leased back to uh, REOC. REOC then released portions of it to us, and there's stacks and stacks of lots of lease ground leases that uh, lots of lawyers, I'm sure, made a lot of money on. But um, anyway, so we closed on the, uh, on the property um, in 2003, but we inherited a, um, um, a hospital that was on the site. So just to give you a little bit more context here, um, you could see on the right-hand side, um, we're in the East River, just east of Manhattan Island and uh, west of Queens. Um, here's an aerial view of the um, island. It's actually long and slender. It's about 800 feet wide and about two miles long. We have several modes of transportation onto um, public transportation onto the site, one of which we um, put in equity into, which is a new ferry stop, which goes from Wall Street to 34th to Long Island City to Roosevelt Island and Astoria. So um, the hospital that's existing on the site right here that you see had to be taken down. So it was 800,000 square feet, the site, um, the hospital, and um, it took almost a year to take this down because each, uh, each of these buildings, which is chevron shaped, um, had to be permitted separately for demolition. So we're in demolition for about a year. Um, this is the overall site plan right here now. So the site plan was designed by Skidmore, Owings and Merrill and uh, James Cornerfield Operations was the um, uh, landscape architects. And so right now we have built uh, four of these buildings, two of which are still under construction, which is the Executive Education Center and the hotel, and those will be finished in 2019 and 2020. So phase one, uh, we had, uh, it was prescribed to us by our planning process of exactly what we needed to have and certain square footages and by certain dates. And we needed to open the campus by fall of 2017. And that encompassed the Bloomberg Center, which is an academic building, the Tata Center, it's look, it's, it says the bridge building on this, it's an old slide. Um, and that's uh, a corporate co-location building or an uh, incubator type of building. And that was wholly uh, developed, it's wholly owned and developed by a developer in New York City, but we are the anchor tenant in the building. Uh, we have a residence hall and we have a central utility plant. So um, let me just go back. So in full build out, we will have, in phase two, we have to build out by 2037, I believe. And phase two will be 1.2 million square feet. There'll be a repeat of the same type of uses. We'll have another academic building. We'll have another residence hall, as well as um, other commercial, um, uh, commercial buildings. Uh, here's just a quick slide on the vertical construction um, that we started in 2015. Uh, just to give you some orientation, uh, Manhattan is to, is to the back of the photographer. And here, this is about one year prior to opening. 
And um, one thing I want to point out here is that we had um, barging um, of, we took off all our demolition debris by barge. That was a pick on, pick off type of operation. And then we had a roll on, roll off, which is a second type of operation for bringing in our facades and bringing in all the steel for the buildings. Um, so that was a really big operation that we undertook. So, you know, I'm here to talk about sustainability, but I just wanted to set the table on, on the context of, of the project. So um, when the initial submission was put into the city of New York for the competition, we set forth our project plans and values. So we wanted to establish excellence in architecture, have open spaces and whatnot, um, one of which was we wanted to provide leadership on environmental issues. And my colleagues up in Ithaca have done some really um, cutting edge uh, type of projects up there. They have lake source cooling, they have photovoltaic canopies, and um, arrays out in fields and whatnot. So um, to the credit of my colleagues um, who were involved with the project before I was, I, I've been on the project for the past five years. I started right after ULERP certification. Um, all these things have been set in place, and that's what set forth all the uh, design criteria. So there was some low-hanging fruit that you could do without really um, uh, you know, investing too much. One of which was these bioswales that we have. They're uh, water gardens. You know, Everyone has to manage their own stormwater. So um, what we did was we had these stormwater gardens. And you could see on the, on the right-hand side there that there's boulders and there's plantings in there right now. I don't think the plantings were in, in this photograph because we, we just moved in not too long ago. But they're natural filtration zones. And this was far better than what was there um, when the hospital existed. So there was catch basins. The cars used to park right on the catch basins. Whatever came out of the cars went into the catch basins and right out to the river. Here, we're managing our stormwater on, um, right on our site. And if there's overflow, it gets filtered and cleaned naturally before it reaches the river. Um, this is another example. Uh, we have a rainwater harvesting tank. Um, it's 40,000 gallons. Uh, you can see uh, by the scale of the size of this, uh, there's some uh, workers in, in the photograph there. You can see by the, the scale of this. So we collect the water from the Bloomberg Center roof, and we hold it in this tank here, and we clean it with UV filters, and it's used for gray water in the um, toilets and the urinals in the building. And if we have a large rain event, and this tank is filled up, it could also um, uh, be an overflow to act for the irrigation for the lawns. So um, there was four technologies that we looked at. I'm gonna talk first about the two that uh, we did not go with. Um, the, first of all, we wanted to look at and see, you know, what do we have naturally on the site that we can capitalize on? There's wind, there's a river, there's sunshine, and we have the earth. So the wind, what we looked at, and for one year before, um, before we even knocked down the hospital, we put up a LIDAR. So it detects in three dimensions the light. And we, we partnered with, um, with some folks to um, get grants from NYSERDA to put this thing up and take the readings for one year. It turns out that we didn't go with this because the winds, much to everyone's surprise, were only sustained between 8 and 12 miles per hour. And there really wasn't a return on investment uh, to put that in just at this time right now. Uh, the other one was the hydrodynamic energy. So there is the East River. Now, the East River is a very turbulent river. And it switches directions every six hours. So um, what we wanted to do was we partnered with one of the professors up in Ithaca and Veridin, and they put in a prototype. And so they measured um, you know, to get energy out of the river, but when you're, it's only bi-directional, so you're only getting 50% output unless you're turning your turbine around. Um, there was other barriers to, um, to having this as a permanent solution to us. Uh, there's you know, regulatory and permitting and whatnot to put something um, in the river. But it was a really, it, you know, we challenged ourselves. We said, what if? And this is, this is what came out of that. And so um, we, I think this is something we'll probably get back to in, in a number of years. But for the initial opening, this wasn't one of the technologies we decided to um, invest in. So um, the other two, we uh, did the photovoltaic energy. So on top of our buildings, and we had a partner with our local um, 
utility with that now. So we're in a pilot program because basically we are taking revenue away from them. So what we did was we went entered into a pilot program and they said, okay, you can generate alternative sources of energy of up to two megawatts on your campus. So we um, put up these uh, canopies above the buildings rather than taking land away. And um, we're generating just under one megawatt between two buildings uh, with our, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in my presentation. So the other technology was the ground source um, uh, heat system, which some people call geothermal, but it's not really truly geothermal. Um, but one year in advance before the hospital was demolished, we had to put in, and you need to take readings so we needed to get the readings of the temperature of the earth and of the water and whatnot. So one of those um, sites, and we partnered with the U.S. Geological Society with this, and we put in one, uh, one well and we measured it for one year because you need a design, you need a basis of design. Um, here's the horizontal piping and the trenching um, for the geothermal system under construction. Um, here on the right-hand side is the section through the um, borehole. There you go down 400 feet, and they are about six inches in diameter, and there's about 80 wells that go down. The reason we stopped it at 400 feet was because at 500 feet and greater, it's a mining permit that you need, and it's a whole other set of regulations. So we just kept it above the 500 feet. And so um, it's a, a closed loop system. A lot of people ask us if we use the river water. We don't because the river is um, it's brackish and the saline would then corrode the, um, the equipment inside the building. So it's a closed loop pure water system. Um, here's some pictures. What's kind of unique about this geologically is that um, we there's natural fractures that occur through the, um, uh, through the rock. There's a lot of rock on the site. And so it naturally, as the uh, river water and the tides rise and, and lower, it also sort of flushes the field, um, if you will. And you could see, actually, let me just back up on that one. Um, you could see the water plume from the fracture when the guys used to hit it with the rigs um, and used to spray all over like Old Faithful. Um, so here's another uh, picture of the vertical uh, loop system and a geologist taking some readings. And so, um, so the Bloomberg Center does not burn any fossil fuels. We, um, we heat and cool the building solely through the geothermal well system, and it goes into fin tube um, perimeter heat system, and it also um, is utilized in the, um, uh, the chilled beams above, um, above the uh, spaces. So here is the lawn, which is above the ground source well field, and it sort of doubles because we were required to have um, open space for, for the public, and so it doubles as that, so we'll never build upon it, and it does double duty for us. Um, now here with the photovoltaic canopy, this is still under construction. Not all of the um, uh, panels have been put up um, in this photograph at this at this point, but as you can see, it's been integrated into the architecture. It just it's just not your standard plain vanilla canopy. So um, the architects are Morphosis, and the engineer was Arab, and so they worked very carefully. And we're required to go before our public design commission in New York City in order to get approvals on the aesthetics of all our buildings. So this had to be blended into the architecture of it. And I think they did a wonderful job. The other building that has it is the Tata Innovation Center. This was designed by Weiss and Manfredi and Thornton Tomasetti was the uh, structural engineer. And this one has a slightly different canopy, although it's the same type of panels that are used. Um, here we show the primary steel on the buildings. It was a significant investment that the university made. And by the way, we thought that we could do this through a power purchase agreement at first, at the same thing with the geothermal well field, and um, there just wasn't a market for it. So we ended up having to invest all the capital ourselves, and, and we are the operators of it. Um, this is just another uh, photograph of the secondary steel and the um, panels going up. And we did this through des both projects through design build uh, delivery method. And we looked at actually a number of configurations of the, um, of the panels. Some were in a wave, some were facing one way and the other way, and we ended up deciding that both canopies will face, um, face the southern uh, way at a very, very slight angle. So here you could see the canopies on both the buildings. 
And up on top, there's a rooftop terrace in between. It's actually um, a wonderful, this is on the Tata Center, and it's actually a wonderful space that uh, people gather underneath it. Now, um, last but not least is the, um, the house. This is a residential um, uh, property of ours. And so this is about 260,000 square feet and uh, has 550 beds in it. And it was designed by Handel Architects and Burl Hoppel was the engineer for this project. And it's got, it's 26 stories tall and it has a variety of product types in the building. So it has micro units, it's got one bedrooms, two bedrooms and three bedroom units. This is because the campus is really, um, the student body is on the, um, on the master's level and above. So some master's students are married, some are married with children. The same goes with the faculty. So the faculty and the students uh, live in this hall. Right now, we're only about 50% um, occupied right now. And so this was built to Passive House standards. All of the buildings, according to our lease with the city of New York, we were required to meet minimum of lead silver. But that caused a challenge for us. You know, we wanted to be better than that. So the Bloomberg Center is now trending for, um, uh, for platinum, lead platinum, and also net zero. Um, the, uh, this, the house here, we decided to go with a passive house standard. So what does that mean? Um, it's not that common yet in the United States, but it's very common over, um, over in Germany. So um, it's about orienting the building the right way. It's about making a very compact design. It's about having continuous um, insulation, thermal bridges and whatnot. And so you know, there's a lot of different criteria in which you have to pass in order to be a passive house. But it's basically a, a very, if you want to think of it, like a very tight thermos. It has a thick outside so it keeps the, keeps the cool in in the summertime and keeps the heat in in the wintertime. And as you could see in the picture here, there was, um, the walls are about 14 inches thick and I think that somewhere has an R value of about, I think 46 or 48. They're very, very thick and very well insulated um, panels. Here's um, some of the, um, uh, the pictures from up top. Um, so they put a lot of amenities in for the students. It's not bad for a dormitory. The views that you get there, you can see the UN and whatnot. Um, and so uh, the students are very happy in the building. They're, um, you know, they're very, they, they, just, they just love the building. And I just wanted to uh, thank you, and I wanted to conclude and just say that, you know, you aspire. You aspire to be better. Yes, we were required just to meet Lead Silver, but we wanted to do better than that. And we utilized our partnerships. We utilized any um, outside entities that would give grants to us for studies. And um, we pulled it all together and, and we made it more than the basics that, that was required. And, and you could do that too. Um, and even if it doesn't work out, like it didn't work out for us with the power purchase agreement, um, if you could find some way to invest the capital yourself, the, it just pays back in just dividends in years to come. Thank you very much for your time and attention.